late Saturday afternoon, regular television programming was interrupted with news of the murder of Sharon Tate and her friends in Bel Air. Los Angeles, particularly the film community, was in shock. A couple of Sharon's friends had considered spending Friday evening at Seattle, which somehow morphed into rumors of a huge party that allegedly half of Hollywood was invited to. Warren Beatty and Natalie Wood, Steve McQueen, Mia Farrow, all claimed to have narrowly missed the bloodshed. Sales of guns, guard dogs, and security systems quadrupled in Los Angeles County that weekend. Friends wondered, could Sharon or Roman have known the killers? Were other entertainers at risk? Beyond Hollywood, some found it fitting that the rich and elite got a taste of the dark side of the 60s. The public speculated in particular about the macabre subject of Polanski's films. That afternoon, the killers also learned who their victims were. I was in a trailer watching Hobo Kelly, a kid's show, Barbara Hoyt remembered. Sadie came in and demanded I turn the channel to the news. She told me to call Tex and Patricia. One of them said, The soul sure picked a good one. They called Charlie that sometimes. The soul. Then they started laughing. Linda was shocked to hear about Sharon Tate's condition. It was never said, prior to seeing the news, that there was a pregnant woman in there. It was very devastating for me. Linda had just realized that she was pregnant. She wanted to grab her daughter and leave the ranch. She wanted to call police, but she was afraid. In jail, Sandy saw the news and allegedly knew the family had done it. That afternoon, a Captain Freeman on a routine patrol with the fire department saw a flatbed truck near Spawn Ranch carrying two or three VW engines covered with sleeping bags. This was reported to the Los Angeles Sheriff's Office who added these details to their growing case against the family for auto theft. If someone had acted upon it that day, perhaps more lives may have been spared. On Saturday, Pat confided in Leslie. Author Nikki Meredith claimed, Leslie said that when she found out that Pat had gone to the Tate house that first night, it gave legitimacy to Manson's helter-skelter plan. It had a huge influence on me, she said. That doesn't mean that I blame her for my actions. I don't. It's only to describe how influential she was in the group. Pat knows that she provided support and comfort to the other women and feels guilty about it because she was responsible for some of them sticking around. But she was unaware of Leslie's adulation and didn't realize that her actions the first night inspired Leslie to go the second night. She said her focus was on keeping her head down to avoid Manson's wrath. I was disappointed that I hadn't been selected to go the first night, Leslie acknowledged. Manson met me on the boardwalk, part of the old movie set at Spawn Ranch, and asked if I believed in him enough to kill. And I said yes. I wanted to do it for Manson and for Manson's approval to let him know I was a good soldier and willing to lay my life on the line for him. Lino and Rosemary LaBianca spent that day at Lake Isabella, two hours north of L.A. They'd been married since 59 and together brought five children into the marriage. Lino had three kids with his first wife, and Rosemary had an adult daughter and a 15-year-old son from previous relationships. Pasquilino Antonio LaBianca, known amiably as Lino, was 44 years old, born in Los Angeles, president of a chain of local markets. Lino was the only son born to Italian immigrants. He had two older sisters and served in the army during World War II. He saw battle in England, France, the Netherlands, and Germany before returning stateside in spring of 1946. He then joined the army reserves. 
His parents bought the home at 3301 Waverly Drive in 1940, while Lino was in high school. He dated Alice Skolnick all during his high school and army years. While he was overseas, Alice lived in Waverly Drive with the LaBiancas, waiting for her sweetheart to come home. The plan was that Lino and Alice would wed when his service was over, and they would then live in the garage apartment behind the main residence. Lino's parents assumed that once Lino and Alice had children, they would move into the main residence and the elder LaBiancas would retire elsewhere. But his first marriage had many trying times. The three children were born between 1948 and 1955. At some point, Lino and Alice moved out of Waverly Drive and purchased a home in nearby Alhambra. Lino was then on the board of Gateway Ranch Markets, his father's business, and Alice got an accounting degree. During different periods, they moved back to Waverly, including in 51 after the senior Mr. LaBianca died, but they couldn't make the marriage work. Alice was in her first trimester with their youngest child when they separated in January 1955. Lino met Rosemary Struthers, born Ruth Catherine Elliott, at the Los Feliz Inn, where Rosemary was a hostess. Born in 1926 in Arizona, one of five siblings, Ruth was separated from her family after her father, a traveling salesman, left, and her mother was jailed following several arrests for forgery. Ruth was then adopted by the Harmons, a couple living in Fullerton, California. The Harmons had lost a daughter to a childhood illness and renamed Ruth as Rosemary in honor of their late child. She was eight years old at the time. She also gained a new adopted brother, Henry Russell. Rosemary's first husband was Henry Martin. While married, she had an affair with a friend, Charles LaBerge. She became pregnant and gave birth to a daughter, Suzanne, in 1948. Henry Martin traveled for work, and during a trip to Alaska, Rosemary left her husband for LaBerge and apparently cleaned out their home of all marital property, including two cars and Henry's valuable coin collection. Martin refused to file charges because he claimed he was still in love with Rosemary. Two years later, she contacted him again, begging for forgiveness. She and her young daughter needed a provider. Henry took her back, but during the next two years, she also had rumored affairs with Ione Reba Gage and again, Charles LaBerge. Gage, also known as Reba Young, was a woman. Rosemary was alleged to have had many female lovers during her life. She was also suspected of being a grifter who married men for financial gain. Rosemary had another affair while married to Martin with Frank Struthers. She left Henry again, married Struthers, had a son with him in 54, and left him for La Bianca. At the time of their introduction, Lino stood to inherit a good deal of money after his mother passed away. After Rosemary married Lino, she and her friend Lucy Larson opened a mobile dress shop and later a brick and mortar store, Boutique Carriage, in the strip mall adjacent to one of the Gateway locations. She also held a real estate license and played the stock market. There is some recent conjecture that Boutique Carriage may have sold the same wigs that Tex and his partner carried at Lovelock's. Some wonder if perhaps there was some competition between the two. Although Tex walked away from Lovelock's in early 68, and it doesn't seem that he had any plans to resume his wig selling venture. However, that does not eradicate all possible connections between Watson and Mrs. LaBianca. Lino has a similar cloud of suspicion hanging over his memory. A gambling addict, horse races, he squandered his family's fortune in Gateway Ranch markets with debt. He also was believed to be friendly with several mob figures. Granted, no Italian-American in the last century didn't have that rumor attached to them. And he set up dummy corporations to hide his assets. I share this information with readers with a reminder that, as salacious as these stories about Rosemary and Lino are, they were not killed for these reasons. Many crime victims are not saints. They may have less than spotless records, 
but that shouldn't diminish our ability to objectively assess the crimes and find compassion for their suffering. Lino and Rosemary LaBianca may not have had the virtue and character of a Sharon Tate, but they were still unwitting victims of the same brutal gang of killers. I want to responsibly share the stories of the victims as they pertain to the crimes that befell them and clear up any rumors and speculation that detract from the story. There have been rumors that the LaBiancas were killed because of Lino's gambling debts. Some believe that Manson stole Lino's little black book, a list of sensitive names in the syndicate, the night they were murdered. That Manson was friends in prison with one of Lino's mob affiliates or that family women dumpster-dived at Gateway Ranch Markets and incurred Lino's wrath. All of this is unsubstantiated and likely false. Lino and Rosemary moved back to Waverly Drive in the fall of 68, purchasing the home from Lino's mother, and several times the home was apparently invaded when they were not there. Lucy Larson later told police that Mrs. LaBianca confided that Someone has been coming into our house. Things have been gone through, and the dogs are inside the house when they should be outside, and vice versa. Additionally, Rosemary told Lucy that she felt threatened by Suzanne, that mother and daughter had troubles. Lino told his mother, We can't live in that house any longer. We can't sleep, and never know when it will be ransacked again. It is weird that the house was only entered when Lino and Rosemary were out, as if the intruder or intruders were familiar with the couple's daily habits. That April, Lino wrote to his daughter, Corey, No new burglaries to report here. No new clues either. There's been a plain-clothes detective hanging around, but I'm beginning to doubt as to whether the culprits will ever be caught. L.A. is getting to be a pretty scary place. There are a group of hippies that have taken over Griffith Park, and two pot parties have been broken up by the police just next door. That's too close for comfort. Curious use of quotes around the word culprits. Lucy Larson said that she suspected Rosemary's kids were the trespassers. Did Lino share those suspicions? The home next door, the one rated for marijuana, was the same house that Harold True previously lived in. Some have wondered if Manson attended a party there, Lino showed up to chew the pot-smoking hippies out and enraged him. It's doubtful. True moved out of his Waverly Drive home the previous year, weeks before Lino and Rosemary moved in. And the actions of Manson the evening the LaBiancas were killed also belie the notion that 3301 Waverly Drive was targeted. What is a potential connection from the LaBiancas to the Manson family is Rosemary's daughter, Suzanne. Suzanne was 21 years old in 1969. She worked at Vanda Camp's bakery, which Mary Berner was known to frequent. She was dating a biker from the Satan Slaves, a rival gang to the Straight Satans, and was arrested with her boyfriend one time. Suzanne may have led as much a double life as her doomed mother. Allegedly, Frank Jr.'s father later accused Suzanne of cutting her younger brother out of Rosemary's inheritance. She was also suspected of cleaning out the house after Rosemary and Lino were killed, of emptying a safe at Gateway Ranch Markets, and threatening Lino's children if they tried to stop her. This is all, again, rumors and speculation. There is no evidence to support the idea that the LaBianca's murders were an arranged hit or fratricide. But in light of Suzanne's behaviors in the years after her parents' death, she does warrant further exploration. I will return to the matter later. Whether Rosemary was a closeted lesbian or a grifter, what Lino did with his money and what their reputations were, this author wants to make clear that it is my belief that neither of these two people did anything to invite their brutal murders any more than Gary Hinman or those at Seattle the night before. The week of August 4th, Rosemary's 15-year-old son, Frank Struthers Jr., was vacationing with his friend Jim Safi. Safi's family had a cabin at Lake Isabella. On August 5th, 
Lino and Rosemary drove to the lake with their speedboat. They returned home while Frank and Jim enjoyed the boat during the week. On Saturday, the LaBiancas drove back up with Suzanne. They planned to get the boat and bring Frank home. But Frank and Jim were having such a fun time, the LaBiancas decided to let him stay another night. Lino and Rosemary drove the speedboat home behind their 1968 Thunderbird with Suzanne as passenger. They left Lake Isabella at 9 p.m. The drive home took longer than usual with the weight of the boat behind them and busy Saturday evening traffic. During the drive, they heard news of the slaughter in Benedict Canyon. Rosemary was particularly horrified by the report. Possibly she thought of her own worries that her house was being invaded, intruded. Or perhaps she was simply a compassionate human who cared about the well-being of others. The couple dropped Suzanne at her apartment, and at 2 a.m., Lino purchased a newspaper from a vendor at Hillhurst and Franklin. This was Lino's regular newsstand, and he knew the owner, John Focianos. Lino bought the early edition of Sunday's Los Angeles Times, along with a racing form. There was a brief conversation between the two men about the tragic news in Bel Air before Lino returned to the car and he and Rosemary drove home. Mr. Fokianos was the last person to speak with the LaBiancas other than the killers. <laughs>